Katie, thank you very much indeed for coming from Sloan Kettering Memorial and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York to uh, Berlin for this meeting of Eurocam Platform. Pleasure. And also thank you for, uh, for being one of the external advisors to the, to the Eurocam Platform um, project. It's very exciting. One of the things you said yesterday, and it was blatantly obvious as soon as you said it, was that, uh, that there's not a great deal of molecular imaging in the Eurocan platform project. In fact, it's difficult to see any at all. And having heard you speak about molecular imaging this morning, I can see where you're coming from. It was fantastic. Tell us what you're doing at uh, Sloan Kettering in the imaging area. So, um, molecular imaging uh, is extremely important because it is an essential element for integrated diagnostics. And uh, integrated diagnostics uh, include uh, pathology, laboratory medicine, and imaging. Uh, the reason is that we are all very interested in uh, genotyping, and, but we don't understand that that only brings us prognostic biomarker. To have a personalized medicine, which is the theme of this meeting, you really need predictive biomarkers. And molecular imaging will offer that missing link for the predictive biomarkers. Initial diagnosis is still going to be pathology and all the serum analysis, including patient data. But after that, when you, especially when you have a metastatic disease, with so many different lesions throughout the body. The tumor metastasis, the biology of tumor metastasis is heterogeneous. Yeah. It is heterogeneous, we all understand, depending on the tissue. It's different genotype and phenotype profiling in the soft tissue, and it's different in the bone. But sure. we now realize, even in the soft tissue, it depends where it is. Mm. And it's only if we really want to drive towards precision medicine, you do need to develop molecular imaging to allow you to have those predictive biomarkers. Now you're uh, talking mostly about PET and, and tracers, and you showed some quite remarkable uh, colored photographs of uh, uh, scans of patients with prostate cancer, for instance, with the conventional bone scan, etc. Oh, yes. CT, etc. And then FD, um, uh, uh, FDHD, uh, FDHD yes. scan. And then your androgen receptor scan. And I mean, that just caused an awe. Tell us about that. Well, it is um, as imaging develops, we realize how little we know, but it's not only in imaging, everything in medicine, the more knowledge you acquire, you cannot believe how you used to treat patients 10, 20, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So the same with, with prostate cancer and looking for bony metastasis. Um, for so many years, we only had a bone scan. And suddenly now that we have specific tracers, such as the one that I show, which is an androgen receptor tracer, you realize how much we were not seeing. And then you have to ask yourself, we used to use bone scan to monitor therapy. And then suddenly on the follow-up scan, there would be new lesions. Well, they are not new lesions. We just didn't see them sure. before. And that's what now we are seeing more and more. So, advances in molecular imaging and really being able to see the lesions better is going to also allow us to better then design the treatment uh, for each patient. And you were uh, talking about thera something. What was that now? <laughs> this is following patients through treatment. I got that much, but well, what's the thera? Okay, so it is the term uh, that is now more and more used, and that's Theranostics. Theranostics. We, right. And it combines treatment and diagnostics. So you shouldn't, we used to, even now, very often, we give drugs to a different cancer based on population science and the data from clinical trials. And I think we all, the one of the lessons that we all learned so well was on cetuximab. 
It was given for metastatic colon cancer. It was a marvelous drug in a clinical trial, but about one third of the patients didn't respond. And then we soon after learn if you do KRES testing, okay. suddenly you can select your patients better. But there's another effect why imaging is so important. Early response, even when you test them well, and like KRES is a very good predictive biomarker, and then, even then, there's a tumor host reaction. So you have to have biomarkers for early tumor response. Because even if all your molecular biomarkers are ahead of time, say this is the, based on biopsy, it's the right tumor, some of them still do not respond because of the host sure. tumor reaction. So you need imaging for the early response biomarkers because you don't want to keep biopsying somebody every two to three weeks. And that was imaging offers. And we now have, I didn't show because I was, it was only 20 minutes, but for example, one methodology that now we are developing for early tumor, early tumor response, it's really a hyperpolarized C13 and MRI where you can really see the reaction that the tumor, that a drug has on a tumor within hours mm. and definitely within three or five days. So we hope that moving forward, you'll see adaptive therapy based on imaging early response biomarkers. And um, will MR play a part as well? Will, will you right. Both MR, MR, yes, yes. <laughs> In the <laughs> so a tracer would be, a, a useful tracer would show up in each. Correct. So we're going to, uh, they, this is sometimes it's a dream, but unless you have a dream, you'll never get there, uh, is that uh, really for the early response therapy and also for monitoring therapy as well as some of, all of the design, you are going to use uh, MRI PET. And this is why MRI PET has been developed. Sure. And uh, the two areas that right now look extremely promising, it's really cardiac imaging, mm -hmm. and then even more so cancer, just because cancer is becoming such a huge problem. <laughs> in 10 years' time, you predicted in your talk that we will have three-dimensional printing. printing. What's that? Well, <laughs> three-dimensional printing is already used in some of the industry. I know it sounds like a fiction, but we know that we will have 3D printing of the radio tracers right. definitely within a 10 year period. Right. You can do a very similar things with drug. It's basically printing on command. Yeah. The problem with in healthcare, unlike in industry, a regular, is a regulatory process. Yeah. So we can have printing in a single hospital because almost all of our, radio, actually all of our, 20 out of 23 radio tracers that we have in a clinical trial are all under our own MSKCC IND. Right. So to streamline the process, we'll have 3D printing, right. but to disseminate, you need a regulatory process. How is it, is it going to help 3D printing? How are you going to use it in the, in the, in the management, research and clinical? The management? ideal? Yeah. Well, you're basically going to program. And, uh, and you, um, there, there is a TED conference on 3D printing wow. in a regenerative medicine where they actually program and you can get out the tissue, whatever you like. So you, with radiochemistry and radio tracers, it's much simpler. Yeah. You simply program what you need to see on the other end. Wow. It, is, it does sound fantastic, yeah. but it's, it is here. This is not science fiction. This is really happening. Yes. And uh, we look forward to hearing about that. So maybe next year we'll do a little, bit, a little bit more about it. Anyway, Kenny, okay. thank you very much. Indeed. Really you're welcome. Thank you so much for that. Thank you.